when my suicide didn't go as planned. And I realized I'm still here. Um, shit. That's, that's, that was my <laughs> exactly. reaction. I'm like, shit. I can't even do that right. When you're, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly f- right. I'm like, <laughs> I fail at life and now I fail I'm at death. S- <laughs> I'm such a failure. <laughs> the hell, Sherry? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I know that because that is exactly what I said. This is going to hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. 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 You know, I thought I was the only one and, and every other victim of every other sexual assault thinks they're the only one. And until I was 35, well, actually, I didn't start even talking about it until I was about 50. I truly believed I, I was the only one. I did not know that there was another living person in the world like me. And that could live through that, that, that travesty that you lived through. And because of the way you were groomed all those years thinking you're the only one actually added to the fact that there's got to be something wrong with me. I'm the only one that's this. So it's got to be, I'm the common denominator in all this. So it's got to be me. And if uh, at one point I started running away in high school and law enforcement would find me and take me home and they would, my dad would be waiting on the porch and they would see my dad and everybody in town knew my dad. And they'd say, Hey, Sherry, there's your dad. Tell your dad I said, hi but they never asked me why I was running. Um, So when I'm working with law enforcement, it's really important that I try to remind them, you know, if you're working with somebody that's running away, we're not running to something. If you can figure out what's behind us, that's, we're running from something. We're not running to something. And you have no safe space. You have no. Well, that's what I was going to say. You you didn't have any like place where you could just feel comfortable and be yourself. When I was in Kansas, when the times that I was there, my grandmother lived maybe 30 minutes from me and she was a safe place for me. She didn't know, but at her house, I was safe. And that was your dad's mother? That was my mother's mother. Your mother's mother. Mm-hmm. So if at 35, you you finally open, you finally, the floodgates begin to open. Yes, that's a really good analogy. All right. And, and I know once... You open that floodgate. There's no closing it anymore. No matter how much you try to twist that wheel. All right, you you have some mental issues where you have to go into therapy. Are we talking inpatient therapy? No. So you you were living was, your life. I'm trying. Yes. And how many children do you have? Three. Three children. So you're a mother. You're going through this. You're reliving a, a, a super traumatic experience, and you're trying to hold it all together. Yeah. That's 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 trying. And then my children's father decided to opt out. And so I added that on top of everything else. Did you find your did you blame yourself for your dissolution of your marriage? Um, no. No, I I rented a little house. Um, things got really, really bad. And so there was a little house that became available for rent about a block from me in a really small town in Kansas. So I rented that little house for a month. I thought if I, if I could get myself together, because everything in the world is my fault. If you fell today and stubbed your toe, I am so sorry, because that's my fault, because everything is my fault. And so I rented this little house and I thought, I'll just stay here for a month. Get, I'll get myself together and then I can go back to my home and back to my marriage and my children. And, but I didn't, I didn't get a chance to go back. I had only been gone one day and um, the chief of police in my town showed up at my door and served me divorce papers. Wow. And what was his reason for getting out of the marriage? I have no idea. You really don't know? Mm-mm. Oh, that's odd. He never, we never talked about divorce. Now, now what were the, what were the kids thinking at this point? My kids were so confused because on the outside, we were the perfect family. Every kid in the neighborhood came, stayed at our house. So you were kind of like Instagram. Yeah, or Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Just the highlight reels. That's it. Just the highlight reels uh, to the outward appearance. You're living the Mm -hmm. the life of Riley. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew. Look at that family. They're so lucky. We know some people like that. Nobody knew I was sleeping on the couch at night because I'd fold up all my bedding before the kids got up and... You know, the the outward appearance was shined, spit shined. It was perfect. And you now now do you think that was a way of hiding your past? That you know you put on this big happy front. 
I just wanted my kids to be happy. Again, I wanted, you were in protective mode. Yes, I wanted them to, to have normalcy, yeah. whatever that was. In some way, though, you have to think that this pain is going to end for you. You know, like when when you get out of a bad situation, you bury stuff real deep, right? And I'm sure you buried this so, so deep, thinking it's just going to go away one day. It's going to dissolve mm -hmm. like those stitches that they put inside of you. It's just going to dissolve. But the problem is the more you bury it away, just it's like it's like a volcano and it just builds up pressure mm -hmm. until one day it That's explodes. It. Absolutely. Did you have an explosion point? Um, probably when I tried to commit suicide, but that was so much later and it, it doesn't fit a pattern very well. Like we like things to be in a pattern. Um, regimented. You said society likes things packaged. They do. And I, I talk about my suicide attempt not because I'm proud of it because I'm certainly not, but my abuse from my father stopped when I was 17. I got a divorce when I was 40. I got remarried about three years later, and life was good. I was living in Kansas City. My husband took a job in Corpus Christi, Texas, and I had been there about six months, and he was thriving and loving it. I didn't fit in. I, could, I didn't look like anybody there. I didn't sound like anybody there. People stared at me, and they would say things like, you have colored eyes. What, what does that mean? What? I don't know what that means. And then I realized nobody has eyes that look like mine. Nobody has hair that looks like mine. People talk in a different language. And I, my, I have complex PTSD, which was spinning out of control. And I just decided one day that I had fought and clawed and scratched for every day of my life. And I was just tired. And here I am 50. I'm living in a condo on the beach. Everything should be roses, but it wasn't. And so I just decided, you know what, there are things, there are things worse than dying. And for me at that point, living had become worse than dying. Now, my husband, who's very in tune with my mental health, um, had no idea that I was so bad, but he was doing so great at his job. And, and you don't want to you don't ruin want to his high. Exactly. I didn't want to be a bother to him. You want to give him so, Narcan. So <laughs> I that, just honey. decided I just... I was just done. I wasn't mad. I wasn't, I, I just was tired. Resigned. I just, I was, I was over. I didn't have anything left to give. And in this juggling all of these balls and pretending to be something that I'm not. And I just decided I was tired. And so I set out with a plan and um, I knew that Gary would leave at 745 to go to work and he'd be home at 815. I mean, 1215 for lunch. Um, I was an EMT for a long time, so I know some things, and, you know, I just was done. How now, are you going to do it? I have a chronic back injury from a car wreck, so I just saved up Vicodin and saved them and saved them and saved them. I knew to be on the tile. I didn't want there to be a mess on the carpet. And, you know, I have people say, didn't you think about your husband? Of course I did. And when I'm working with anybody, mainly law enforcement now, I say, what do you think I thought? And they all know the answer. He'd be better off. Absolutely. He'll be sad for a hot minute. But then, then he'll find somebody that can love the way that he loves, somebody that's not batshit crazy like I am, and he'll be so much happier. Now, that was when I was 50. I should have been over it, right? People ask me all the time, are you still talking about that? Yeah. When are you going to get over it? Yeah. Well, I take 30 pills every day just to digest my food because adrenaline has dumped in my body for 60 years and my organs are breaking down. My thyroid doesn't work. My liver doesn't work. My, my, uh, uh, you name it, they don't work. And the thing about people like me is I have a doctor that I'm working with who's very good, but if you break your leg, they cast it, you don't put weight on it, you let it heal, and then you're good to go. But for me, I'm like trying to bail out water from a boat that's still taking on water because I'm still dumping adrenaline every day and I'm still trying to get my body to work right and, it, and it's not but it's better I'm working with a really great guy and the only way I can stop it and you guys probably know this is by breathing breathing treatment it's Wim Hof yes 
And everybody knows Wim Hof. That doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop it, but it breaks the cycle. For as long as I'm doing that, I can stop the, the adrenaline cycle from dumping. Could be a temporary relief. Yes. And that's really all you're looking for at this point. Yes. It's a, it's a re- reset of your electrical system. And it, it stops the dumping of the adrenaline. So, so that was, you know, if all of that stopped when you were young, why in the world when you're 50 are you trying to kill yourself? Because eventually you can no longer run away from the prairie fire. <laughs> no matter where you go. There you are. Correct. So I have an analogy with prairie fires. Okay. I don't, I don't know if um, you've ever heard this before, but so I was reading a book about how to survive worst case scenarios. I'll give you a very short version of it. And normally human instinct is to run away from danger. It's just how we're right. born. Well, I was reading this book and it says how to survive a prairie fire. There's no prairies in New Jersey, but I read it anyway. So if you they see may a, have them in Corpus Christi, yeah. in Kansas, we do prairie fires. So if you see a prairie fire coming towards you, this big wall of flame, you're going to try to run away. But if you run away, it's growing and growing and growing until it, it will consume you and you're going to die. When all you have to do is run straight into the fire and you'll get through to the other side and you'll be, you'll be scarred, you'll be charred, but you're going to be alive. It's kind of like trauma in our life. The more you try to run away from it, it grows and grows and grows until it consumes you. It's nothing different than a credit card bill. Okay, don't pay your credit card bill this month. Run away from it. Don't pay it next month. Run away from it. Interest, interest, interest. And it just grows and no longer can you afford even the monthly payments. So that's that's my theory. Okay, it's what's worked for me. Um, when I did a an about face and headed straight into the fire, that's when my journey of healing really started. And what was your moment where you turned around and started heading into the fire? It was that morning when I when my suicide didn't go as planned and I realized I'm still here. Um, shit. That's, that's, that was my reaction. Exactly. I'm like, shit. I can't even do that right. When you're, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly a... right. I'm like, I fail at life and now I fail I'm at death. Su- I'm such a failure. <laughs> the hell, Sherry? Yeah. That's, I, I know that because that is exactly what I said. Exactly. I'm like, you're a failure at life. You're a failure at death. I guess you're just a failure. They were right. And everything. Yeah. yeah. Everything they said about you is true. Um, it took me a minute or day or two to tell Gary I knew he'd be devastated, not with me, but he'd be mad at himself because he didn't catch. But listen, I'm Academy Award winning actress. That's what I did for my whole life. Yeah, I was going to say you were acting your whole life. Yeah, it's all I know. So that that after that event, I decided I'm taking my life back. And so I started a new kind of therapy. I started EMDR. <laughs> and it's the craziest thing I've ever done, isn't it? It's, it's like cra- it, chicken yeah. voodoo. I don't know. It's weird, but but it it changed my life. It's almost like when you donate, you want Inagata Devita to be playing in the background. It's so weird. Yeah, it is. It's very strange, and you don't realize it when you're doing it until like a couple days later, and you're like, hmm. you just sort of become introspective, and you start remembering things. You start like thinking about things, and a little peaceful, and. So it's it's bizarre. It is. And I, I have a great friend, Holly, who who before she was not a therapist when I was doing EMDR. And I would tell her about these crazy, crazy things. Well, she is now a therapist and she does EMDR. And she said, I, I in my professional life, I need to call it EMDR. But all I hear is you, Sherry, calling it chicken voodoo. And that's what I want to call it. And I said, well, probably probably don't do that with your patients. But anyway, and that was that was when I decided mm, I'm not living this life. There's there's more. There's something better for me. And I'm I'm taking my power back. The first time you got up in front of a people, group of people, and actually let go and told your story, was the reaction what you thought it was going to be? The first time I told it was not a verbal story, which is a little odd. I was asked to do what was called a cardboard testimony. And so on the front of it, it says who you are. Um, suicide, incest survivor, I think was the first time I'd ever written the word out. Uh, suicide survivor, incest victim, because that's what I thought it was. Um, suicide survivor. And then on the back, it says who you, who you're striving to be. So I couldn't even say the word incest. It, it made me want to throw up in the back of my throat. So now, so then a little group asked me to come and educate them after, after I did this little cardboard testimony. And I thought, I don't know why they want me. I don't have anything to say. 
but I did. And then another little group in Corpus. And then about the third one, my husband, who's a brilliant businessman, said, Sherry, this is going to get bigger than you, which I thought, that's so dumb. I don't even know what that means. And he said, I want you to be, I want to set you up as a nonprofit. I want you to do this right. And I said, I can't run a nonprofit. Did you forget? I'm ugly, stupid, dumb, did, 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 did. And I can't run a nonprofit. And your husband, if he's a husband like it, nope, I fully remember. <laughs> I remember. He said, no, maybe you can't, but I can. And I'll help you. And I remember he said, the first thing you need is a board. And I was so excited because I knew I've got this one. I, I got this answer. I got it. And I said, okay, okay. Do you want me to go to Lowe's or Home Depot? And he said, no, Sherry. No, no. What your husband was trying to do was empower you. And he did. He really was trying to empower you. He's like, okay, let's make lemonade out of lemons. This happened. Can't change it. Can't unring that bell. But we can use this mm -hmm. to make yourself better in who you really want to be. And he did. And I started what, my can nonprofit. We say your, can we say your husband's sure, name? Sure, Gary. Gary. I'll tell you what, Gary, my hat's off to you. Yeah, okay. You're making us all look bad, yeah, Gary. No Stop. Shit. No kidding. <laughs> You're really making us look bad. No, that's that's wonderful. I mean, so I I started. Then I had a little college in Georgia call me, and and I went there. And when I was at that college, speaking to the student body, it's been six or seven years ago now. There was a police officer waiting at the stage, and I thought, what well, he needs to go on about. He certainly he needs to go unlock a door or whatever it is law enforcement does. Did you think you had warrants out for your arrest or anything? No, but I knew <laughs> he was going to challenge me. I knew that. And so when I made it through, all the students want to talk to me and tell me their story. And I, he waited and he waited. And so finally I went down there and I introduced myself and he was the chief of police. And he said, um, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Okay. And he said, can you come to my office? Shit. Okay. Never been to the chief of police office, but okay. And I thought, here we go. He's going to tell me everything I'm doing wrong. And he said, you said a lot of things. And he was at the time probably 60, 60, 62. Some things you said go against everything we, I learned in the academy and we teach in law enforcement. And I said, okay. And he said, I want to learn from you. And I thought, he, you must have fallen down and bumped your head. <laughs> Because I got, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm, remember, I'm dumb, stupid, uneducated. I didn't get to go to college. And so, you know, for example, he said, you don't make eye contact. And I said, you're right, I don't. And he said, but we're taught that if your person doesn't make eye contact, they're lying. They're lying, yep. And so he started taking, together he and I built a class. And he said, I, how soon can you teach my officers? I said, teach him what? And he said, everything you know. And I thought, I don't, you, uh, mm -hmm, no, though you people are educated and smart and I am not. But I just decided to come at it from the other side. I'm not, I can't teach you from the book, but I can teach you from a victim. And so that's what I do. We built a four hour class. We built an eight hour class. I'm so honored that my class is post-certified. Um, and I get to go, I go on site and I, so they don't have to send their officers away one by one. I come in and I do um, all the PDs, colleges and sheriff's departments and. and Post-certified. Now that, that is, they get credits for their continuing education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I found that in doing that, I don't have to sugarcoat my story. I don't have to watch my language. The door is closed and. I just tell my story. You could be yourself. I can. For maybe the first time in your life, you could be yourself. Mm -hmm. And they're not offended. And they're not going, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. She said a bad word. So you let all this stuff out. How much better has your life been since you've released? Oh, I can't even. Is, is, the, is the dam that was built up behind you starting to recede? Oh, it's, it's almost all gone. And all the Viking are gone? All the Viking are gone. <laughs> Because if they're still there, just we'll talk yeah. afterwards. No. You should have brought up. <laughs> um, my back injury, as soon as I, I, I'm still tense all the time. And, but as soon as I started letting go of that, then my back injury started becoming better because I'm not holding on to everything. And it's the built up tension. It is. It's the built up tension that's making everything hurt. And 
Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, I can't change my past, but I try every day to be a better mom. And my kids and I are so close. They're grown and, and I have grandkids. But every time I get invited somewhere and I get to educate and I have law enforcement tell me, Sherry, every law enforcement officer in the world needs to sit under you. Or they'll say, I will never forget you. Good. Uh, I'll tell you straight up. I'll never forget you either now. <laughs> Thank you. I, they'll say you. to me, I have listened to you and realized how badly I screwed up my sexual assault cases. Because the first thing I ask them when I go in there, who wants to take the sexual assault cases? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-mm, nobody. Hands are crossed, arms are crossed. Nobody wants them. You know, normally I would ask you, like, if somebody else was in your shoes, what advice would you give them? Stuff like that. I'm, I'm going to change this around a little bit. You have seven-year-old Sherry sitting next to you, and you have 62-year-old Sherry's brain and her, her current outlook on life. What do you tell seven-year-old Sherry? I, and I've had to go back and do that. I've had to go back and find her and make peace. Um, listen, there's enough blame to go around, but it doesn't belong to her. You can't at seven years old be your father's wife and try to go to school every day and try to hide. And your brother and sister's protector. My mother's protector. I was my mother's mother. And I carried the weight of the world. And the fact that I came out the other side is truly unbelievable when I stop and look back from where I've been and miracles do happen. And what I know now is that I love life and my voice is loud and boisterous and my laugh is loud and obnoxious and I don't care because I love life. And I spent the majority of life trying to run from it and hide it. And so I just embrace every single day. And I just, I just want to help because I admire law enforcement so much if I can help you guys do your job a little bit better, then then I'm absolutely elated. Temper your admiration for us, because not all of us are good. Most of us are good, but some of us are. Eh. You never knew Kevin when he was a cop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where can our audience find you? Corpus Christi, Texas. No, you can find me. I <laughs> At have 739 a... <laughs> Mockingbird Lane. <laughs> um, I have a website, sherryalsip.com. Uh, the name of my nonprofit, it's a 501c3 is um, Courage Starts With You. It took me a long time to come up with a name. And when my chief of police, who retired, and I'm still mad because I lost my partner, um, when I was trying to think of a name for my nonprofit, I was driving back from Atlanta or from where I was to Atlanta. And I thought, man, that took a lot of courage for that person, that educated person to come to me and ask me to help him do his job better. And it took a lot of courage for me to tell my story. And I realized it starts with each and every one of us. Courage started with me when I tell my story because only 7% of incest survivors go on to tell their story because we're- 7%? Seven. Wow. And the average age for disclosure is 53. Holy shit. We live our life in such bondage because we don't know how to get out. So my advice to anyone that's listening is don't wait till you're 53. There's an amazing life on the other side. We're coming to the end of this thing. And, um, well, can I answer your question? You can find me on Facebook. You can Fa- find me. <laughs> well, if usually on the website, you, yeah, there's yeah. all jumping off points. You can find all the social yeah. media on there. And we're going to put links in all in our show notes. You have lived every child's nightmare and every good parent's nightmare. You have lived it. Um, and, and really, if you think about it, every daughter's nightmare. Every, but it was at the hands of your father. I mean, there's so many different dynamics here, but it, it's a bad, it's a bad, bad situation. But it's had to. It, I know it's taught you something. So, what do you think your suffering has taught you? To look for the good. Whatever, whatever life has dealt you. You know, I can't tell someone I, that's lost a child. I can't say to them, I understand. Because I don't. Because you I've don't. Exactly. never lost a child. But Yeah, you did. You lost little Sherry uh, I, when she was well, seven years old. Yeah. Yes. But use your 
life experiences as a torch and and light the light a light light the next person's light because if you'll do that then we one by one by one we can begin to heal and mm. and make the world a better place we we'll make that thin house of cards fall i can't thank you enough for coming in here it was hard for me to hear um yeah. but it was necessary it's a hard topic but but, it, but it's necessary but there's life and there's joy and there's laughter and that's what i want people to know i appreciate you Jerry, really you, you are an incredible person. You really are. I Thank mean, I you. am so, so touched that you're still here today. Very honored to know you. Yes, absolutely. You're a survivor, and I can't wait to see what you do in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me, you guys. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast, The Suffering of Incest with Sherry Alsup. And let's think about all the stuff that we learned. Putting down roots is essential for children. Society likes things packaged. Some people don't deserve to have kids. Get triggered, get better. Run towards the fire, but most importantly, love life and always look for the good. Always. And that's going to do it for this episode. Don't forget to go to our sponsor, the Oakley Kitchen on, uh, what is it? What's it? Seven, uh, what is it? 789 yeah. Bloomfield Avenue in Nutley. Go to popple.com for a digital business card. Put in the code TSP20 for a 20% discount. Follow us on all social media. That's LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> follow Mike at Mike underscore Felice. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And of course, follow the Suffering Podcast. And we'll see you on the next episode.